good afternoon. Thank you all for showing up today to make this event take place. A lot of people couldn't make it tonight, um, so um, hopefully next time they'll be able to show up. Um, like I said, my name is Sean Miller. I'm a wildlife photographer. I've been living in Okinawa, Japan for over 20 years, and I initially got scuba certified in 1992, so I've been diving here for a long time. And I really got into underwater photography in about 2010, and I started document, documenting the, the animals of Okinawa. Okay? Uh, I concentrate or I specialize in fluorescence and endangered species and conservation. So that's, if you want to see more of my work, you can check out OkinawaNaturePhotography.com, Facebook, Flickr, Instagram, I'm all on there, okay? Um, as far as fluorescence, now how many of you have actually been on a fluoro dive or actually used blue light before? So raise your hands up so I can see it. Now how many of you have actually tried to photo photograph it before? Anybody in here? Okay, cause technically it's pretty difficult, okay? And I'll explain why as the presentation goes on. But so tonight I'm going to talk about fluorescence and then I'll get into what fluorescence is. I'll talk about what equipment that you're actually going to need. I'll talk about the initial settings just to get started with it because it is difficult. And then I'll go over some improvement and then I'll show you some of the animals that fluoresce and why they fluoresce. And so this is still new to, fairly new to science. So there's a lot of information out there and there's a lot of discoveries you as a diver can make that nobody's ever seen before because there's animals that fluoresce that nobody even knows about yet. So you could actually find something new that no scientist has found yet. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so basically what fluorescence is, this is the easy way of explaining it. It's the absorption of light at one wavelength and it's re-emission at another longer wavelength. So you're using blue light and most of your fluorescence that you're going to see on the reefs here are going to be green and then you'll see yellows, oranges and reds are much rarer, but mainly you're going to see bright, vibrant greens. Okay. And in this slide, I'm going to explain how it works and what equipment that you're actually going to need to see fluorescence or to photograph fluorescence. Okay. So first you're going to obviously need a light. You're going to need some form of blue light source. Okay. So right here, you got your blue light and you're shining your blue light on coral. Let's say this coral would normally fluoresce bright green under blue light. And so what's happening is the blue light is hitting this coral. Some of the light's being absorbed. Some of the light is being reflected. Okay. Now this, this light's being absorbed and it's coming back and now you're having fluorescence and excited light coming back. So if I was to photograph that right now at that point without this yellow barrier filter, what I'm going to get is blue, on the outside and then I'll have some of the fluorescence showing. But what's happening is a lot of it's being absorbed so I'm not seeing true fluorescence. So what you need if you want to actually photograph or see true fluorescence you need a yellow barrier filter right here that will actually block the excited blue light that overwhelms it. So some people like having that blue light in there. You've seen some of the aquarium uh, some of the aquarium set up with all the vibrant beautiful colors uh, the corals really popping out and that's due to those blue lights but of course they're blending them and they're not using any yellow filters but if you want to have true fluorescence you have to use that yellow filter and if you want to learn more about fluorescence the pioneer Dr. Charles Maisel his uh, website nightsea.com he's the master he's been doing it for over 20 years and he came up with this technology so look at his work if you want to know the scientific side of it you know I'm just talking the basic uh, photography side of it tonight okay now, so some of the equipment that you're going to need, obviously you're going to need some way to capture that actual image, okay? So you're going to need a camera, you're going to need your blue light source, and right here I have a night C made by light and motion and a Gobi night C made by light and motion with adjustable arms with my Icolite housing. And then I have another light and an arm up here with white light. So if I do make, need to make any adjustments, I can come back here and actually see my adjustments, my buttons on my camera, because you're doing all this at night. So if I was on a night dive and I turned my lights off, my blue lights, I would not see any fluorescence at all. It's going to be pitch black. The only way I see fluorescence is using blue light. Okay, so you have to have some form of light source. Now here's my barrier filter. Now over the front, I like having it adjustable where I could take it on and off because I could actually if I want to go back later and shoot something with white light I have the ability to do that where if I put on a lens cover a filter over my lens now it's yellow the whole dive and I can't do anything about that so here I have the ability to take it up and take it off 
Now they also, like if you go to the Night Sea website, you can see that they also provide these masks, okay? So a barrier filter mask that goes on the top of your mask so you can see the true fluorescence with the blue light when you're diving with it. So it cuts back that excited blue light, right? But the problem with that is, you know, you have to continue to have that filter on all the time. Some people like that, some people don't. But what I do is I pull it, I look through the corner of my barrier filter while I'm diving so I could see the true fluorescence really pop. You could still see it just by looking at it, but it doesn't really pop. Or there's certain colors that you might not be able to see unless you have this barrier filter where you're looking through it. Okay, so very important to have that on there. Now, this is obviously the equipment that you're going to be needing. You're going to need light sources, either constant lighting, right? Um, this is video lighting or just constant lighting, or you're going to need a filter, a blue excitation filter that would go over the strobe. So there's many different options. Most of the time I shoot with this, constant lighting. That's just what, I've, what I started off with, what I had. And initially, later on, I got one of these excitation filters just to test it to see how well it works for Microlite. It's a great product, it works. And um, so it's just personal preference based on what you have. But you're still gonna have to buy a blue light no matter what to see what animals do fluoresce in order to find them to photograph them with this filter. So you have to have some form of blue light source, okay? Now I'm gonna get into true fluorescence. And I talked about true, flu true fluorescence where you have to use that barrier light and you're only seeing the true fluorescence and nothing else, okay? Now, up in the corners here, I just put my camera settings so you can get a general idea of what settings I would shoot in, okay? And this is using constant light and I shot this in a fish aquarium. And some animals fluoresce really bright and some of them not so bright. So you have to continue to change your settings every single subject matter. It's not always gonna be the same. So I can't give you, hey, use this setting here. You have to constantly change your settings because some things are brighter than others. But the first thing you wanna start off with is manual mode. You wanna be familiar with your camera so you can make all those minor adjustments, okay? Your shutter speed, you gotta think about what are you capable of shooting in your hand and getting a sharp image without any shake or movement or any blur, right? So for me, when I shoot at night, I generally will shoot at 100th to 200th of a second. You can see here, this is 100th of a second. So that's still keeping a steady locked hand in order to do that. Otherwise, I'm gonna have a blurred image if, even if I move like this, okay? So you have to be steady if you're shooting with constant light like this. So even with, if you're using flash, generally you will shoot at 160 to 200th of a second. So you wanna keep it there, but if you're a little shaky, then you would wanna obviously increase the shutter speed to anywhere probably from 500 to a second, 500 of a second, okay? But now that's gonna change everything also because your aperture setting. Now generally when I shoot wildlife, if I'm shooting up macro photography, I use smaller apertures of like F13 to F22 to get a better depth of field and show more of the image. It's gonna be sharp, more of the animal is gonna be high quality sharpness. But now when I'm shooting this underwater, um, fluorescence, there's not a lot of light. So I have to let a lot of light inside, right, to the sensor. And so I have to use smaller apertures, which is a larger opening that allows more light to go into that camera lens, okay? So that's why I use larger apertures. In this situation, I was using F7. And you can see um, ISO 4000. So that's extremely high. Most people wouldn't even shoot at that high, right? They wouldn't push the limit up that high, but I, I don't mind pushing up the limit when I have to in that situation. Now you can see the image here, and uh, it's not the, the sharpest image or the high quality, it's not really that high quality, but this animal did not fluoresce very bright. So I had to push the ISO, the sensitivity to the sensor really high in order to get this image, okay? So I had, that's what I had to do. Now, uh, Dr. Charles Wild, uh, Charles Basil, he recommends shooting with white balance setting on cloudy. You could do whatever you want. Auto works fine also, but that's what he generally starts off with so he doesn't have to do so much post-processing, okay? So white balance, if it's not on cloudy, if it's on auto, no problem. Shoot raw if you can. If your camera's capable of shooting raw, um, shoot raw. If you shoot JPEG, that's also fine. But with raw, you have much more ability to recover highlights and then adjust your white balance more so you could tweak it. So the whole goal is when you're seeing this fluorescence, you're seeing these beautiful colors and you get back, you put them on your computer and you're gonna edit them. But you wanna make them look 
realistic. So what your eye saw, you want to try to match that. Okay? And the whole goal with post-processing is to limit the time you're spending on the computer. Because I guarantee most people that do, do take photos underwater, when you go out for a dive and that's all you're doing, I bet you you take 100 to anywhere from 200 photos, right? And if you're editing every one of those images for five minutes, that's a very long time you're spending on editing images, okay? So the whole goal is that's what I've learned over time. I've taken thousands of images, and now I really concentrate on what I'm photographing because I don't have the time to go through all those images. It just takes way too much time. I'm already behind, months behind on, on images right now as it is. So it's, it's really time consuming. So try to get it right, right off the camera, and it'll save you a lot of time, okay? So that's true fluorescence. Okay, so this is a lizard fish. This is one of the many fish that you actually see fluorescing in Okinawa. A lot of the eels will also fluoresce. And um, so I shot it at 1 60th of a second, 5.6 and ISO 1000. And this one obviously fluoresced. It was much brighter than that, than that lizard fish was. So I could change my uh, ISO. I could lower my ISO, my sensitivity. So this image is a better quality than the other one. And when you raise that that ISO, it becomes really noisy and really mushy and grainy. And, you know, a lot of people are hesitant. They're, they're, they're scared to shoot at high ISO because they think, oh, it's not going to be great. I'm not going to get published. But I've had images that were shot at 6400 that have been published in big magazines. So it's, it's definitely capable, but you have to get your settings right. And, uh, but don't be scared to shoot at high ISOs, okay? Okay, so fluorescence is a mystery and scientists are still trying to figure out why animals fluoresce. Okay, so some of the reasons would be for communication, finding a mate, forms of camouflage or UV protection like sunblock. Okay, so these are some of the reasons that, they're, uh, that they think why animals fluoresce. Okay, and so there's not a lot of research done on it. And so in the future, I'm sure we're gonna see a lot more. And you saw on Facebook, one of the, um, images from a National Geographic photographer of a turtle fluorescing. I'm sure some of you have seen that, but it went viral. As soon as he shot it, they posted it, Nat Geo posted it, it just went viral after that. So that you never know what you're gonna see that will potentially fluoresce. So I spend a lot of my time, even at night when I'm hiking, looking for uh, critters up north, I bring a blue light with me and I just test it in the jungle. I'm walking and I look to see if anything shines or fluoresces. And sometimes I find some really neat things. So, and I'll show you those in a little bit. All right, so this is what I was talking about, what it looks like if you do not use a barrier filter, okay? So it's being overwhelmed by the blue light. And this was just shot with my iPhone. I put, I uh, had my blue light, I was reef walking and I just shot it just like that, okay? But you're seeing it's overwhelmed and you're, and you're really getting all that distracted blue light and that fluorescence from the sea anemone is really not popping, it's just bland, right? Okay, so this is what it looks like. So we have reflected and fluorescent light. And some people like that. This is what looks similar to an aquarium. And everybody has their own style. It's your personal preference, what you like. I like doing both, you know, because you do true fluorescence and that's all you're seeing. But it is nice to have a little bit of blue in there also. And this is what the reef looks like. I put the barrier filter over my wide angle lens and dome port. And this is what it looks like. So this is, but you can see there's certain areas of the reef that are gonna be brighter. And this area here, of course, turned to mush, it's blown out and all in here. So certain areas, even in this coral, fluoresce more than the other section of it. But this is what it looks like, the reef at night. It's really beautiful, but most of the stuff you're gonna see is just bright green, okay? And it's a challenge just to find anything orange or red. And these are, these are the different colors you're gonna be able to find. Really rare, of course, the red, and then of course the oranges, and then you get yellows and mainly greens. So a lot of the corals will fluoresce, and a lot of times when I'm diving on these fluoro dives, the whole dive, I'm just diving all blue. So it's really important to make sure you know your camera settings and you have good buoyancy control because it's pitch black, you're at night, and all you're using is a little blue light source, okay? And um, so it's very important to maintain good buoyancy control, otherwise you're gonna be running into the reef and potentially injuring yourself. So here's some more up in the upper left-hand corner. We have some soft coral I shot with a wide angle lens. This is the blue light reflecting off my dome port, uh, mushroom corals, you know, just, just a variety of different corals and mainly green. Here's some more sea anemones, uh, corals, green, a little bit of touch of orange. 
And then uh, some of the other critters that I found, uh, we have land crabs. And of course, it didn't fluoresce very brightly, so I had to push up the sensitivity of the camera. Chitons, um, eels, and then crabs. And of course, you can see this, the blue light's so powerful, it's being excited at that point and overwhelming it. Um, sea slugs. So we have flatworms, um, nudibranchs. So here, of course, I photographed the nudibranch in the white light. And you can see here, this is called the serata, and basically it's the protective body part of the snail. So they don't have shells, so they have to have some form of protection. So I believe they were eating possibly stinging hydroids, and then they consume them, and then they bring them out here on their body part as defense. Okay? So this was really interesting because only the serata are, are actually uh, fluorescing in this subject. Where here, you can see the nudibranch, the whole body, is, is actually fluorescing. Of course, it's not the best image, but you can see that the whole animal is actually fluorescing. Glowing eels. Here's some eels that I found uh, last November when I was reef, reef walking in Ona Village. And then I saw these little eels coming out of the sand and they're only about 90 millimeters long. And then I captured them, put them in a little uh, tank and just took some video of them. Um, but I was pretty impressed just to even see them. Yeah, pretty neat. So, like I said, you never know what you're going to find that will fluoresce. The hard part is trying to capture it and get good footage or get a good image on it. That's technically the, the difficult portion of it. And I still have a, a lot to learn with it, and I'll always challenge with it. This is one of my interesting finds. And I was reef walking. I flipped over a rock, and out comes a sea cucumber falls off, okay? And at that point, I noticed it was fluorescing because I was walking around with my blue light and I saw a little bit of fluorescence. And then I immediately touched it and then it left the imprint of my fingerprint on there. And I was like, that is pretty cool. And then I looked at my finger and then the pigment is actually on my finger. So I believe this is maybe a form of sunblock or UV protection that this thing could produce for its pigments to protect itself in the sun, potentially. I'm not sure, that's just, that's just what I think. Okay, so this is this is something in the future. I'm sure scientists will be will be dealing with or studying. There's been no research on this at all right here that I found. So this is what it looks like in the white light. I photographed it in the studio. It's crawling around and uh, it's called the Meet Your Neighbors Project. It's basically a project where we use we isolate it. And so there's no distractions other than all you see is the animal and uh, images are used for conservation awareness and uh, and protecting the environment. So it's, it's a really ne neat technique, but you isolate the subject and you only focus on it and you don't see anything else around it. Now, floral blending, this is a technique that I, that I sort of developed. And um, it's almost like there's two images in one. So think of as uh, if I took an exposure in white light and then I took fluorescent and I combined them together into a composite. This is not a composite. This is one image. But what I'm using is I'm using the blue light, the night sea light, I made some specialized filters. I also have a little bit of UV light, and then I have a tad of white light added. So I'm exposing all this. I call it floral blending. So it's blending the light, but you can see, like it's hard to see up here, but you can see a lot of the fluorescence you're picking up here. You're picking up the fluorescence in the anemone. Um, you're picking up this green fluorescence here. So it's, like a, it's almost like a composite. So I'm always trying to push the limits and try to do something new because uh, true fluorescence is great, but it, over time, you know, you sort of get in the routine of doing the same thing over and you want to develop a new technique or try something new. Here's another example of floral blending. So you can see how beautiful, the beautiful lit this coral is and this triple fin uh, fish is on there just sitting and resting. We have a uh, brittle starfish, but you can see it enough where it's lit enough so you can actually tell what it is, right? Here we have tunicates, they're lit up bright and nice. You can see how well they fluoresce. And then the eel is still fluorescing some, and you can see the back of the coral fluorescing. So it's just blending the light. Now, glowing hydroids, this was a new discovery in the Red Sea, I think last year. Scientists found these hydroids, which are stinging cells, and um, they found them and documented them that they actually fluoresce. So I went out, I knew they fluoresced because I've seen them before, so after that I made sure I went out and photographed some for myself. But basically a lot of the marine gastropods, they have 
these hydroids on them. And I believe it's for protection. It's a symbiotic relationship for protection to prevent other animals from feeding on them. Like a lot of snails will actually feed on them, moon snails. Fish might feed on them. So as soon as they get on top of it and try to bite them or eat them, of course they get stung at that point. So it's a symbiotic relationship between them. Now, this is what it looks like with the blending, the, the blending of light, the blue light. So I wanted to show some of the animal, but also show this, the, uh, the glowing hydroids at that point. Now, some of the fluorescence is so strong, you're gonna be able to see it in the daytime while you're diving. And I'm sure many of you, every one of you in here has seen fluorescence in the daytime. And this is fluorescence using, using strobes. I photographed it with white light, but it's so powerful that you could still see and photograph the fluorescence without having any blue light, okay? So that is definitely possible. Now, fluorescent enhan enhancement. Now this is probably my favorite type of fluorescence is where you enhance it where I'm not using the yellow barrier filter, okay? So for example, if you went out you know, on a night dive and you lost your yellow barrier filter, it just disappeared, right? You have this option. You have white light with you and you have blue light with you and you can do this, okay? And all I'm doing is I'm blending the light. Um, it, not every piece of coral is gonna be able to do this, but it has to have some form of uh, fluorescence. And what you're doing is you're just capturing the luminance, the bright colors, you know, and it's, 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 another, it's another challenge, okay? But it's really beautiful colors. Here's some more. Same thing, just using the night sea with white blended light. And sometimes I'm just doing this in the daytime, you know, 40 to 60 feet, just blending the light nice. And some people prefer this. Some people like the true fluorescence. Everybody has their own taste in it. Here's some more. Corals, a lot of the corals. And now here's an example of white light, okay? So you can see all the detail, the coral, the polyps. So you can see the, 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 the detail and the sharpness. So here I'm shooting at probably uh, 200th of a second, ISO 200, low ISO, so I don't get a grainy image, I get sharpness, and then probably F16, okay? So I get a good depth of field. And so you can see how sharp and clear the image is. Now you look over here, and you can see the image, the quality is just not as good as it is over here in this image because now I had to push the ISO up probably to 3000 or so, right? So you get more grain in the image, more mush, I should say. So, but that's true fluorescence. Now here's where I blended it. So I added, you know, a touch of white light along with the fluorescence to blend it. And then this is all fluorescent enhancement, just using the blue light with a touch of ambient light, okay? Now another option, okay, is if you don't have that filter, is just using the blue light underwater. And sometimes it actually brings out different details that you would see in the fish that you wouldn't normally notice, like especially in the scales that I've seen. Like look at the beautiful scales on this. And so all I'm using is I'm just shining that blue light right on them, okay? And um, blue light subject lighting, okay? Just, you know, you're underwater, just want to try something new and you get you get bored eventually you're going to, you're going to get to a point where you continue to dive and you, you're going to love diving to the point but you're going to eventually get to a point where you're like man i'm starting to get bored with this or you're going to be you're going to be thinking about what food you want to eat while you're diving you know and all of you have been there where you're like okay but you get to a point with that in photography where you're doing the same thing over and over and over and it's like okay what can i do that's going to be a little bit different and this is one of those techniques you could add and uh, here's where I'm using backlighting. So I add this to the back. So on the arms, I bring the arms around and backlight it with the actual arms itself. So it makes the image pop. It adds a little bit more vibrance, color to the image, okay? Nudibranchs, lionfish, crown of thorns, okay? And then every year during cherry blossom season, which is coming up soon, I always make sure I create an image that nobody has. I try to create an image that nobody has yet. And you, as you know, there's millions of photographs of a cherry blossom, but nobody has done this, okay? I did this last year under blue light using the actual, um, uh, I used the barrier filter. And what I did in this situation, this was done um, with a long exposure. So basically the camera's on a tripod, all right? I have the yellow barrier, barrier filter over the front and the exposure is anywhere from a minute to three minutes long, okay? So what I do is I hold the light, you know, it's pitch black, 
right? And I light paint it. So I bring the light and I just, you know, just basically painting with light. Like I was using a light uh, paintbrush, but I'm actually using the actual flashlight itself. Okay, and of course sometimes it takes me a few times to do this to get the exposure just right where everything is blended perfectly. But this is, uh, these are cherry blossoms that were photographed, but they really pop under blue light. And so of course later I had to go out and find other things that would fluoresce, right? And I always wanted to do the sunflowers. And my daughter and I were on, on Tory Station and the farmers were just cutting down these sunflowers. And we're like, we stopped, I had to go ask to go grab some. He's like, sure, go ahead and take some. So I took them home, put them in the studio, and they did a long exposure. That's about a three minute exposure. And that's be light painting, actually, the sunflower. Okay, so I enjoy trying to find a lot of new things. And I haven't worked with, it's been a while, but it was nice to do this presentation because I haven't worked with blue light in a while. So now I could get back in the routine and find some other things. Now this is probably one of my favorite images. This is a coconut rhinoceros beetle, which is an invasive species. And, um, but you can see, look at these eyes. They're just bright green. Same thing, this is light painting, but you can see the detail in this image. It's really sharp. Where if you look over at this one, it's not so sharp because I'm using a high, you know, because this insect, of course, would be moving at that point. So I have to use a faster shutter speed. This insect at the point was just sitting on, the, on, this, on this branch right here and it wasn't moving any, so I could do a long exposure use the light painting so I didn't get any movement in the in actual insect itself. The moth, millipedes of course, some of the millipedes here they fluoresce, beautiful colors. We don't have any scorpions here otherwise I would have photographed those but we don't have any that I found yet so it's possible. Alright so then we get into improvement and a lot of times I see people going out or I go out with people or I see people underwater diving, photographing, taking pictures, videography and they start off fast. You know, a lot of people, they, they move fast. Now, if you breathe fast, right, you're going to move fast. If you start off slow, you're going to move slow. That's how it generally works, all right? So start off slow, okay? You don't have to rush when you're in the water. Just start off slow. And most importantly is maintaining and having good buoyancy control. Because the guys that have good buoyancy control are the ladies, the people that have good buoyancy control, are going to be able to take good images because they're comfortable and they're confident and they have slow breathing inhalations and they're just, if you give them a camera, they're going to have good results quickly. But a person in the water that's uncomfortable, that's sporadic and swimming everywhere, he may have a $10,000 camera, you give it to him and he's going to have trouble getting good images. Okay, so you got to be comfortable in the water, but also you got to know how to use your equipment. So it's important to use your equipment, practice it on land. Okay, you could turn off the lights, put a modeling light on, set up a rock or something that looks like a nudibranch and practice shooting it, right? That's how you get better at it. So you understand your settings, you get familiar with things because some of the, some of the camera housings, when you look at the back of them, they're not labeled. So you just have to know, you already have to be familiar with your camera to know what button you have to push in, right, to change things. So it's really important to be familiar with your camera, okay? Um, I already mentioned getting the shot right on the camera so you limit your editing time so you're not spending hours and hours of editing, right? So, and then if you can, if you uh, take a photography class, do something to learn, to get better, to improve, right? There's plenty of classes out there online. There's YouTube tutorials, right? And I use them all the time. I get a new camera, I jump on there and I learn, you know, so that's the most important thing. So, uh, so that's it with the presentation. Are there any questions anybody has on underwater fluorescence or fluorescence? You played with the color spectrum on your barrier filter in here, any leading towards more orange, red or yellow? Yeah, I, I always, I have used, uh, I have made my own orange barrier filters and I have got different results. But um, I just, I, I'm sticking with the brand, the brand names right now, you know, with the specific lights and, uh, but I have, yes, I have used that. But um, I, I found out that with the yellow barrier filter, I got better results with it. But there's all, you know, you gotta practice, try new things, yep, yeah. Anybody else, fluorescence? No? Okay, well, thank you for your time, I appreciate it. All right, and oh, thank you. <clears throat>
So we're also going to have the time where this, this gives us some time because it was a short presentation for meet some new people, right? We got a lot of people in here and uh, meet some new dive partners, interact with them. And some people did bring their cameras in. So you're welcome to check out their cameras. You could talk about cameras, different camera settings. Um, yeah. So, all right, we'll be, we'll be in here for a